All right. So uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee and especially Walter's efforts to organize this uh, and many previous uh, protein electrostatics conferences. Uh, this is a great platform for us to exchange ideas and new developments. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it in person, but but anyway, it's great uh, we can still meet online virtually. All right, so before I start, I'd like to first thank the people who did the work. Uh, most of the work I presented today are done by three graduate students, uh, Edward, uh, Shiji and uh, Hai Xin, and the first two are in industry right now. And uh, Hai Xin is uh, currently a postdoc at Andy McCamus lab. And the collaborators responsible for today's work are mainly that of uh, Yong Duan and uh, Davis and Pietra uh, Cplac at San Diego. And uh, we would also like to thank the rest of the Amber developers for their great help and insight. So uh, before I start, I would like to uh, just briefly overview our uh, research program. So our main interest is on developing simulation models and algorithm. Uh, this is uh, mainly collab in collaboration with Duan and uh, uh, CPLAC. Uh, so the ongoing efforts are mainly on uh, polarizable force field and the salvation models, and also new uh, method basically algorithm is associated with uh, those uh, models. Uh, we are also working with uh, well lab people on drug design, uh, protein ligand binding in cancer biology. And then the second main thing is actually on uh, biosynthesis of a biofuel or drug-like compound. This is basically protein engineering effort. And finally, this is uh, antibody recognition of uh, amyloid fibro with uh, Charlie Gray in the department. And we're grateful, but once again, right, this is an acknowledgement for the support by NIH. All right, so uh, just a very, very brief uh, introduction to the uh, research, uh, as is the same as with many participants here, our interests are on computational study of the interplay of protein sequences, structures, and dynamics, right? The goal is to use this uh, understanding to uh, uh, to, uh, in, to interpret protein function or the changes of protein functions. So regardless of which specific system we're working on, uh, one key issue is uh, that, uh, you know, these uh, molecules are very large, maybe not as large as 50S, but it's very, this is very different from a typical, like the toy that you play in organic chemistry lab. And we know that the gold standard of any molecular science is the quantum high, high level, right? Ab initio quantum method but unfortunately uh, the dimensionality is so high for any modern computer to handle. So, but nevertheless, right, the, this highlight, right, what we want to use as the benchmark to develop our uh, simpler models. So our computation models are falling into the so-called self-consistent force field. So this is initially pioneered by Lifson at Wiseman Institute of Israel. And the modern force fields such as OPLS, Amber, Charm, and Gromos are all variants of this earlier work. So the outline today is basically, uh, I just want to first highlight the importance of polarization right, by using uh, the recent application of uh, amber force field in a very interesting uh, system. And then we're gonna actually just dive into the detail of our recent development, like it's force field development, the algorithm part. And then the second aspect is actually the exploratory parameterization and actually basically quality analysis before we, you know, Okay, this model, we want to see whether it's any good. So here is the first is a, some uh, motivation or introduction, right? So, so we're using the, uh, the importance of uh, polarization, right? You, uh, well-traveled protein ligand bindings, right? To, to highlight the, its uh, significance in, in molecular modeling. So the receptor we're focusing on is, is this uh, urokinase uh, plus Minogen activator, UPA, right? So its main function is to activate signal cascade to form plasmin. Right? For example, you know, this is a, in the, involving lysis of fibrin, protein aggregate involving blood clotting, uh, the degradation of a uh, extracellular matrix, and also alter uh, tissue adhesion uh, properties and also promote cell migration and chemotaxis. So many me metastatics, cancers, and uh, vascular disease are, you know, showing this uh, its 
important role since it's overexpressed. So that's why it's actually a, you know, an important cancer target. So the ligand that we're working on is actually, this is 10, is, you know, 10 of the many. So we have a lot of, everyone we have structure and then we have binding affinity, good, uh, very consistent data. Uh, you know, the, this is apparently not very trivial. And the system is about a 30, 28 thousand atoms, and they're both charged and the neutral ligands. And some groups are mostly charged. Some group, group are partially charged, right? Meaning that they're titratable. So our initial goal, it was to see whether our current modeling infrastructure, essentially, you know, the point model, I think the uh, FF14, right? Uh, force field and the best simulation protocol, you know, everything on GPU highly optimized can reproduce this major absolute binding affinity. The thing that we chose to do is actually on the absolute binding, right? So we're not trying to do just a relative binding here. So it's actually pretty challenging. Okay, before we start, it's apparently this is, we have crystal structure and so we want to visualize what's going on there to see uh, is there any, any issue or like our, in our understanding. So there are several titratable side chains inside the binding pocket, the two S's, two S and two His, two, two bases. So, you know, to, to recap this uh, structural property, right? This binding is essentially stabilized by two sets of polar interactions. The first one is uh, between this uh, positively charged emitting group here at the tip, uh, which is very common among all the uh, uh, inhibitors uh, is actually interacting with uh, both ASP192 and also serine 193 inside there. And the second one is actually formed by the phenyl group, this is a hydroxyl, with, uh, with, a, with a HIS46, and also another one is uh, the serine 198. And worth mentioning is that there's a contact distance between the phenyl oxygen, right? And this uh, hit, and this uh, serine is actually only 2.2, the lower bound of hydrogen bound. So due to this short distance, uh, the phenyl hydroxyl was in inferred to act as an acid, you know, since it's actually the pK is not that crazily high, right? And it's actually deprotonated in the, in the bound state. And the his 46 is interpreted to be a, to a protonated HIP, like the amber dragon. So it's actually the donor of hydrogen bond. So the controversy here, right, is the hydrogen bond between the phenol and this uh, his is actually longer, right? it's 2.7. So even if they're, you know, both charged, it's uh, just a charged hydrogen bond, right? So it's actually, it's actually, we call it subbridged. Somehow it's actually shorter than the, uh, longer than the sort of the, uh, the, the other uh, hydrogen bond. So we think that, uh, an, Alternative hypothesis is that this uh, that is also satisfies this uh, uh, stereo constraint is that for both of them to be neutral, all right? Uh, so so basically, HID uh, the his will be HID the neutral form, and this uh, phenol is also neutral. So the key here is that unfortunately we do not have any direct BK measurement. Right? So I guess it's pretty hard to do. So let's see, you know, uh, which uh, inter hypothesis right is actually you know. And to inter to sort of agree with the uh, observable, right, which is a binding affinity, the best. All right. So so how did the amber do in this project? All right. Our unfortunately our initial attempt right, was a very as a total turn off, right? If you just look at the D4 setting, right? So the D4 set out, right? No, there's no correlation. It's actually anti-correlation, right? It's actually going in like, the opposite direction, right? It's supposed to be diagonal, right? Along from the orangey. So this is actually, when you have a fresh uh, graduate student, right? It's basically when, when Edward first started right? this project, this is what happens, right? So basically what he did is actually just add a counter ion to only neutralize the system. And you just use your everything default, right? Without considering this uh, receptor binding pocket. So one thing that, you know, I think most people usually, you know, overlook, right, is actually the condition and right, the salt concentration. This has actually become very important for charged uh, system, right? Uh, if you add physiological salt, it seems like you, you can see some benefit, right? So for example, the RMSE is getting smaller, the correlations become finally zero, okay, almost zero, 
instead of negative. All right. Apparently, another discounted issue is actually the you know looking at the protonation state right of the ligand and uh, the binding pocket. If you follow what uh, was uh, hypothesized, at least actually the consistent protonation, right? Both of them are charged. You will see a, a further improvement, uh, also improvement, right? So you see a positive correlation. Uh, unfortunately, the RMSC is getting higher, but at least actually the correlation is very, very positive compared with uh, this zero correlation. And finally, if you combine both uh, the salt and this uh, correct, at least actually consistent protonation, right? You have even further uh, co correlation gain and also the error is actually reduced. <clears throat> but the, unfortunately, the agreement is still uh, not great. But in general, right? So the absolute binding is really hard. And it's, this is not a cheap calculation, right? I think this is, each of them it takes over microsecond. I think, you know, combining, you know, there are, I don't know, I don't even remember how many windows we have to use for both the decharging and uh, decharging and these, uh, you know, for soft core calculations. <clears throat> so what is actually the additional issue, okay? The additional issue we believe, right, is the uh, the omission, right, or the overlook of the uh, electrostatic, electronic privation, right? This is apparently due to their, you know, it's very expensive to do. And uh, so far we do not really have a very high, uh, highly optimized MD engine for, for using pervasive model. <clears throat> okay, so so this is usually we just, uh, you know, nobody's actually using any pervasive model for, for TI, at least actually in Ember platform. But this is actually a very crucial uh, issue here, right? For example, uh, the water interaction right, is actually overestimated by the best possible water model, the T5P. <laughs> but you know, I have to say, Alex, the SPC is also great, right? So this is actually the data we have here. This is actually one of the best models. Uh, this point model, right, simply follow Coulomb law, right, as any other water model. So this allows a very highly efficient analysis, right? However, there are two limitations, right? It cannot capture the uh, effect of exposure to different environment, right, such as the protein interior and the water or the membrane. Okay, because different environment, right? So gonna in, in, induce different polarization effect. <clears throat> but secondly, uh, this point model are, are derived with the so-called pre-polarization, right, built in, right? There's a delay on purpose. And uh, so that's why they can use it in a, a liquid state, right? So salvation state. That's why there's a 30% error, right? You, if you use this model in this uh, like non-polar or gas environment. So when you do this, uh, you may use this model in the, you know, in the, in the simulation, friendly simulation, in the pocket, you often lead inconsistency. <clears throat> so this may not show up in relative affinity with a similar charge molecule, but they can show up with diff very different ligand with different uh, net charge. <clears throat> so, what we need is actually, we, we need a, really need a polarized model right, in this situation, right? They're still under development, right? So we're working on this, uh, both the engine and the parameterization, but it's still, right? So before that, you know, at least for a way out, right? One way out before this, right? Is that we can actually still try to use uh, like, a, you know, what we have is actually continual PB uh, to account for privation. So the thing here, the trick here is simply using a solute dielectric constant that is not one, right? So then we can actually consider partially, at least partially the privation effect. So, so what we did, basically Edward went ahead, you know, using this idea, right? So he implemented this called a bar PBSA approach, basically using all the MD, the TI simulation, and then they post process all the trajectory uh, with, uh, with a bar approach. But instead of using the original uh, electrostatic energy from the explicit water simulation with strip of water and all the uh, salt, the only remaining counter ion, right? So we, we use PBSA to calculate new PBSA uh, electrostatic energy. Uh, then we start to use it to process all the energy using the free energy, right? Using the, M, the M bar script. <clears throat> so does it improve the agreement? All right, okay. Remember we had, we say, right, there are two hypotheses, right? One is actually the, the pr previously proposed protonated HIP and also the deprotonated HID, right? So 
so we just like try all sorts of enumeration, right? So it's all HIP, everything HID, and then you know there's a small ligand, big ligand, you know, alternatively. Uh, this is try to make it, this actually to satisfy the reviewers' uh, comments, right? You know, you should actually enumerate all possibility there. I think which is a good idea. So we enumerate all of the possibility. So still, right? It's actually it's very 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 expensive, right? For each one is multi. Uh, now at least like a microsecond, since we had to repeat five times uh, of this uh, TI to make sure the statistics are actually good enough. So the simulation show, right, this all HID uh, scenario, right, best capture this, uh, best agree with observable, basically the observed affinities, highest uh, RMSD, uh, smallest uh, error, and also the highest uh, correlation. But uh, but if you look at the difference, right, is it still the difference is actually pretty small within the KT, right? So, so this indicate, right? So you know, to really settle down this issue, right, you really have to uh, have some uh, direct PK measurement. Okay, so that is actually what we uh, see here. <coughs> so to recap this, right, uh, the ionic binding calculation. So we we did extensive simulation, right? Total actually over. 500 microseconds right, to benchmark the impact of different modeling conditions on the ionic ligand binding prediction or analysis. Uh, we highlight the importance of vaporization uh, in also actually pronation right, in alchemical simulations of especially the charge ligand. Right? So we developed this barp PBSA approach as a temporary uh, solution right, to incorporate at least uh, partially the electronic polarization effect. <clears throat> and we we show that a uh, two pollination setup actually satisfy this uh, steric constraint, but the all neutral HID, right, is actually best reproduce uh, the observed affinities. Uh, so in general, right, our simulation here, right, calls for like, a, you know, more research or development on constant pH or chemical simulation, right, which is a robust, very highly efficient, provides a force field. And also for, you know, so we can have some, uh, have a more user-friendly analysis of ionic ligand bindings. Okay, so that is actually basically the introduction, uh, basically the first topic on the uh, on today's talk. And then I'm gonna switch gear and to talk about uh, our recent uh, development of a second generation of polarizable force field. So, so that talk essentially, right, is actually is a pep talk to highlight you know, the importance of a depolarization. That's why we've been spending like, a lot of time uh, to de develop a modern uh, amber uh, polarizable force field. <clears throat> so here is a typical formulation for amber uh, force field. Uh, if you add this uh, polarizer, usually, right, you know, it's, especially in the previous generation, if you just uh, add a polarization term using induced point dipole, you will get a polarizable model. Okay, so basically the idea in, in the general AMBER strategy here is actually we try to uh, achieve a, as much consistency with the point or previous uh, classical force field as much as possible, for example, bond angle, torsion term, manual, uh, so that is actually, you know, inter, we can share the same uh, uh, MD engine as much as possible. So in, that's why, you know, in recent release, right, it's actually in center, the sort of the, uh, for academic application, right, the old uh, sender program, we have both uh, additive and point charge model, non-additive non model available. <clears throat> so if you look at the point model, right, point polarizer model, right, there's still uh, quite a few uh, limitations. Uh, the first one is actually that if you just use it straight without any sort of, a, you know, uh, alteration, you have this, uh, it tend to lead to a polarization catastrophe. So because when the two dipoles are too close, they just induce like, like crazy. <laughs> and you have it and you blows up, your MD engine uh, simulation gonna blows up. So the latest model usually use some kind of screening function, right? Uh, for example, the Soleil model was used actually in Amber's the latest uh, uh, polarizer model. That's actually Amber FF hole 12. But the problem of this is actually a violate the Poisson's equation, right? You're screening something and you're not screening other things. And so your charge is not screened, you're only the dipole is screened, things like that. Uh, anyway, so, you know, you, you just screwed up, you know, you're just cherry picking the term that you want to, it's causing a problem. You're just trying to screen, screen it. 
screen those terms. Okay, so so that is actually the uh, some limitation there. So instead of this, right, we decide to uh, use a more elegant approach. Uh, so this is based on this uh, a brand new approach using a Gaussian multiple expansion. So essentially, this is a general term is p uh, n here, right? So it just could be any term, right? Many many term. So you're using the Gaussian term and its derivative uh, as a, to to expand the charge distribution. So in this uh, current generation, right, we're only using the first two terms, so basically monopole and dipole, charge and dipole. So if you're using only two terms, the energy is actually quite, it's, it's, it's still more expensive, right, than the like Coulomb law, right? So you have the monopole, charge charge interaction, charge dipole, and dipole dipole. So you have three terms, right? But as far as uh, if you compare with the previous dipole model, right, it's also three terms. Uh, the key difference here, right, is that the energy, right, and its derivative is just going to be in like a, you know, error function related. And they're all like a finite, right? So they're no longer divergence, right? You know, if you look at the Coulomb law where all the point dipole, they're going to actually have this uh, divergence when, when the distance is approaching zero. So that's actually the singularity is gone. So that's actually the main benefit, right? And by using this, you don't have to use any sort of additional screening, right? So this is all like the diffusive distribution of the charge and dipole is going to just remove all of this uh, singularity. So that's pretty elegant. So that's why we're uh, trying this. Okay, so, so given this, right? So given this, uh, the, the main thing here remaining, right? So those are a pretty old idea. Uh, the idea here is the next thing is how do you use it, right? How do you use it in like sort of MD simulation? So it's basically the interface with PME. Everything is easy to do, right, in gas phase. But once you get into water, it's, it's become like complicated. So uh, to make this work, uh, a former student, Hai Xin, right, who work out this, uh, all the derivation of all the detail of energy and the force, right? It's numerous pages of derivation, all right? So basically his conclusion, right, come down to this two very simple and clean uh, uh, expressions. Uh, basically after you, uh, you, know, you, you set up your model with all the permanent moment, and then you, once your induction is has converged, basically all the induced dipole has converged, you can express the total energy, right? Basically as that of a contribution from a charge and also contribution of the dipole law. Both terms are, you know, is well, widely understood and it's actually consistent, right? The energy term is consistent with uh, those uh, in the literature. So what is actually uh, new, right? Is actually the formulation for the force. This is actually a first, uh, analytical closed expression for force for in, induced dipoles or whatever moment you have for permanent moment. And the first term is primary, right? The QE force that is widely known. And the second term, and this is actually due to the flexibility of the covalent geometry, right? So basically the fluctuation of the dipole moment in the, in the context of field. And the third term is basically uh, your total dipole moment, both permanently and induced in the, the greeting of the field, right? The greeting field also have a term. And all of this is actually uh, coming together very nicely. Apparently, uh, this is different, but you know, it's actually apparently it's, it's mostly correct, right? In the literature, right? But in the literature, right? Uh, the, we have been thinking that the permanent dipole, right? M multiple right, has both a force and torque term was well, induced dipole, right? Only has this uh, force term. Right? So this is actually, uh, it's not completely correct. So our approach, right, has been, you know, verified by finite difference approach and also new uh, multiple, a lot of uh, uh, constant energy uh, MVE simulation, right? So they are showing that this uh, oppression is consistent. For example, this thing we're doing here is actually in the second phase of this uh, development is actually trying to uh, improve this. Uh, this uh, horizontal model efficiency, right? <clears throat> so this is all based on our previous theory and the algorithm development, right? So given all of this clear, the next issue is actually to cut down the cost, right? So the biggest uh, issue here is uh, the induction calculation as in any other uh, horizontal model. So in, in this uh, approach, right, many people have been using uh, 
history information, essentially using previous dive dipoles, right? To estimate the current steps uh, dipole moment. So like shown here, right? Using, you, you can just use the last steps uh, dipole, for example. You already see by a uh, few improvements. For example, you see two, about two step uh, iteration gain by using the just last steps uh, uh, information in the, at the in initial guess of the dipole assignment. Okay. Well, in, this is actually compared with uh, just using permanent fill, right, to uh, to estimate the uh, dipoles, initial dipoles. Now the problem here, right? So you, you, this is good, right? So you can see the timing is got reduced. Uh, however, if you look at the the energy drift shown as the first two rows, uh, you you always tend to have a, like a two to three times the big, uh, two to three times bigger like energy drift with the same convergence criteria. So, so the, the, the bottom line is that if you insist on a similar, right, similar like energy drift, for example, right, if I want to use something, if you want to achieve something that is similar to TIP3P, I could use a permanent field to assign my dipole. I only need to use a convergence 10 to minus five. But if I have to use a, if I want to use a history, I have to use a even, tighter convergence criteria, 10 to minus six, to achieve something similar, like 10 to minus four level. This is actually the energy change uh, kick out per mole per picosecond. So that is essentially, you have to use a tighter convergence to achieve similar convergence criteria. In the end, you're not really, you know, gaining much, right? You're actually making it slower, right? See, this is 5,532 second per 100,000, People uh, southern step. If you look at this uh, using the uh, permanent field, you're, you're actually a little bit faster. So that's that's actually the turnout, right? So basically, in the end, you're not getting any gain in the in this practice. So so uh, my student, right, the Haijin, decided to just look at this, right? It, he really wanted to see what's happening there. So if you look at the error, the error that was. Uh, Initial error, basically from the two assignment, right? Once is history, once using the permanent field, you can see that the error in the using history, right? The, you know, u mu minus, minus one is actually smaller than the uh, uh, situation when using just uh, no history. That's apparently true, right? You know, that's why you know it's faster since you're you're starting at a better uh, situation. But what is puzzling here, right? So once you achieve convergence using that, whatever convergence you're using, usually with just using the relative norm, right? Compared with a constant term on the right side. And you see that uh, this calculation using history actually has a higher error after convergence than those without history. This is the orange curve uh, peak. And if you look at the, uh, the so-called outlier, basically we define the outlier is a thousand times bigger than the tolerance level. You can see that the outlier is actually quite high in the much higher than those uh, with just uh, no history. And interestingly, the, 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 the difference right, is getting smaller when you're using tighter and tighter conversion. And that makes sense, right? Eventually these are all achieving the same. If you have a zero tolerance, you, everybody is gonna be the same, but you never can get that, right? It's too slow. So. So, uh, so what is it? So this to show, right? This is just to show that this two kind of situation is totally different. You know, you have a very different uh, convergence quality. All right, and it's actually something wrong with. Essentially, we think that there's some some limitation in the way we check convergence. So instead of using uh, this so-called standard approach, basically relative norm. We, we want to use just like individual relative di individual dipoles maximum relative error to check the uh, convergence. Basically, we want to make sure every dipole has achieved a similar, uh, at least some certain levels of uh, a certain level some uh, a convergence. All right. So let's see how does it work. You know. So our experiment, right? So show that the new strategy, right? So the energy drift is now. Uh, can all achieving uh, comparable uh, levels if we use a similar uh, sort of a convergence. For example, this is a relative error. Uh, can, 
for example, this is a 10 to minus uh, five times uh, 10 to minus four, uh, minus four kcal per mole for picosecond. Uh, whether you're using history or not, uh, all the energy drift can be falling into that range or even better. And the uh, RMST fluctuation is all similar. And the benefit, the interesting thing here, if you use history, your induction number is still reduced. So you see that, right? It's about a two to three uh, number recreation smaller when you use history. So that indicate, right? Even with this, uh, more like a stringent commercial error check, you can still achieve the desired, uh, you know, sort of a benefit of using history. This is consistent with uh, uh, people's, uh, other people's work to, to use history uh, to improve this. <clears throat> All right. So given this, right? Given this sort of a convergence issue uh, address, then we actually try to, we have tried to develop a few more tricks to speed up the uh, induction. Since we no longer can need to worry about the use of history, the side effect of that, we, we optimize uh, the use of history, basically use, uh, developing the multi-order uh, extrapolation approach uh, to optimize the use of history. Secondly, we, we use, uh, uh, we develop a, a better preconditioner, basically based on local iteration, basically we do not use any uh, PME calculation to speed it up, uh, to refine the iterative procedure. And as among some other tricks. So in, in the end, uh, we can achieve about a, a you know, 200% improvement with this reference approach, you know, so it's basically if you use a 10 to minus six and the previous step iteration, uh, you know, versus that, you know, we can actually cut down the uh, induction iteration from 12 to around, around the two and to achieve similar uh, energy uh, drift values, roughly uh, about something, a few, uh, you know, about five to oh, times the 10 to minus four it can promote per picosecond and a drift, drift similar to that is uh, in the T3P water models. Apparently, we still have other issue. Uh, you know, since uh, you can see that you know, even if the reduction number, it, induction number is in, reduced from twelve to two, but the timing is only reduced about a factor of two, right? So there's still uh, quite a few uh, optimization that can be done. Okay. Uh, we're working on that. So given that, okay, right? You, so have a, not, you have a few more minutes. Yeah, right. I think, okay. I th okay, yes. Yeah, I think we're almost there. Uh, so so in this next part is actually just a, few, a series of uh, slide highlighting the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sort of our uh, promiseration effort. Okay. So first one is actually trying to reproduce uh, uh, polarization, polarizability anisotropic uh, uh, phenomena. So the system that we work on is actually this series of uh, aromatic system. So basically uh, what is interesting about this molecule is that their uh, polarization uh, is actually orientation dependent, right? The, the in-plan and out-of-plan polarizability is very different. So can you capture this uh, effect with your models? So. So this is apparently important for those uh, systems with, uh, with aromatic system, such as nucleic acid and also many ligands. <clears throat> so here is actually the uh, uh, sort of a summary of those uh, tests. Okay, basically, if you look at the overall probability, all the model, right, we tested is actually quite reasonable. Uh, even if this uh, sometime is actually even better, you know, the old model Soleil without one, two, one, three, is actually even better than this, uh, slightly better, right, than this uh, PGM model. But if you look at the, the tensor, right, so it's basically all the detailed, uh, different orientation-based uh, analysis, you can see that this model suddenly becomes so much worse, right? This is all relative error here. And uh, turns out the PGM with one, two, one, three is all at the best. Uh, uh, also, the Soleil was one, two, one, three. <clears throat> so, so why this is actually, you know, this highlight, right? So, you know, if you have to address this uh, uh, polarizability uh, and isotropic effect, you need to consider all the interaction. You cannot just omitting this one, two, one, three. So that's actually show the benefit of this uh, PGM since it has everything got screened uh, nicely. All right. <clears throat> 
So that is actually, the, that's why we have using the PGM with all the one to one three term uh, included by default. The second thing that we did is actually develop this uh, uh, ESP based uh, electrostatic fitting model. <clears throat> so here uh, we're showing you this, for example, for the water model, how the thing gonna looks like, uh, where we put the dipoles. Uh, they're actually, we tested the three model without any permanent moment, with dipole moment, and also with some virtual uh, dipole moment. And then here is a summary of the uh, of the quality. You can see both the dipole and the quadrupole are nicely reproduced with the new model. And also the agreement with the QM ESP is dramatically improved by you adding more and more uh, permanent dipoles. The last one is just with the virtual dipole and it just doesn't change too much. So we're not using it anymore after this water analysis. However, not everything is great. You know, if you look at the uh, non-polar model with no dipole moment, you know, all zero here, uh, we have a, not a very satisfactory agreement with QM. Actually for Aston, right, we see some improvement there, but for benzene ring, there's virtually no improvement there. So we're working on this. We're sort of aware of this situation and we're trying to uh, develop the next generation PGI model to, uh, to improve on those non-polar molecules. Okay, so for the third thing that I want to share with you is actually the uh, the benefit of using uh, this PGM uh, polarized model in uh, reproducing a many body effect, essentially the you know polarization effect, right? Uh, can you actually improve it, right? So before we do that, as first apparently you need to actually define some term. What do you mean by many body interaction? Right? You be you better do something that is easily reproducible with different model like QM and MM. So a part of interaction energy, right? Suppose we're using these two sets of uh, a glycine dimer, right? As a, our test system, we want to understand uh, the multi-body effect between these two sets of uh, glycines above and below this dash line. So the interaction energy apparently just the total energy minus each uh, group of uh, glycines. Uh, how about, how do we define the so-called, you know, multi-body effect or multi-body uh, interaction energy? So that's basically the interaction energy uh, we define in the first line minus the interaction energy of the two innermost glycines, the two are uh, sort of uh, beige colored uh, carbons. So that is basically how we define it. So it's kind of easily reproduced by both QM and MM simulations. So how do we do it? Uh, okay, the first thing apparently, right, is actually to uh, make sure you can calculate this uh, energy, QM energy with uh, the best possible model. If you use a CCSD as your benchmark and you study the, you know, uh, mention, uh, mention like a hydrogen bond, just peptide bond in dimers, our glycine dimer, you, you can see that the best possible model that's still tractable on our model on computer is the Omega B97XD model. And it shows the smallest uh, uh, error compared with the CCSD benchmark. So that's why we're using this. Uh, as a benchmark to study bigger system, all right, it turns out, you know, all the polarized model, right, okay, is better than the uh, non point charge additive model. And among the polarized models, uh, the PGM perm and the PGM induced without a perm, right, without perm model is actually the, turns out to be the best. So this shows that overall, right, polarized model, polarization, right, can be best produced. This, this non additive effect right, can best reproduce by the, polarized models with no, no surprise. Okay, the last thing that I wanna talk about is actually the so-called uh, transferability, right? Given your, your fit your model with, a, you know, like a single monomer or like, a, you know, can you transfer that to a bigger system? So here I'm showing you the transferability of water model from you, you train it with a single water model. Can you transfer it to like oligomers, right? This is actually tetramer here. This, this two row is actually the biggest dipole moment cluster and the smallest dipole uh, cluster at the bottom. This is uh, your ESP QM result. And here is all the difference from different models. You can see that, the, uh, you know, the widest means that the smallest deviation here, right? Uh, the, the smallest one was actually was those, uh, those PGM with the perms or different kind of uh, arrangement, uh, different kind of models. Uh, the, to, to see the clearly the, the difference you can using this box plot uh, overall, right? So the PGM per model has the smallest error. This is actually for the uh, 
uh, for the uh, ESP. We also have uh, the slide for the, for the dipole moment. Overall, these two models are actually showing the best agreement with the QM calculations. Another thing is actually, it also, if you look at the bigger cluster, right? So if we did a quite a few different clusters for waters. So in all cases, right, we can see that the PGM uh, with the permanent model or is actually the best overall, right? You reproduce both the dipole moment and the ESP models. And one last thing that I want to highlight is actually the uh, transferability of the PGM model over this uh, polymers, right? Oligomers, right? Peptide, this is the first one I believe is, uh, this is actually the alanine. And uh, the, we also did the glycine here. So both uh, dipole moment and the ESP are shown here, the agreement. Uh, you can see, right, that the red one is actually a PGM with a permanent model, and it, which is uh, consistently stay at the bottom with the smallest error. And if you see the additive model, is actually the, the agreement is getting worse and worse with longer and longer uh, poly, uh, peptide. Okay, to recap, right, our development, right? We developed a closed form and an equal formulation for PME, PGM, electrostatic for MD simulation. So we optimize the induction calculation, okay, to well guarantee energy conservation. And we're working on optimized engines for, for CUDA and MPI. And we have demonstrated for the prime transition part, we demonstrate the benefit, right, advantage of PGM you know, framework in modeling electrostatic polarization. And then we're working on the water model and the protein force field. Basically, the electrostatic is all there, right? So we're not going to change that. It's actually the, the, the other term, right? The manual needs to be optimized using some decent engine, MD engine. And finally, we're exploring the next generation PGM model, right? So, so that we can use it for the future release of the, the force field. And then finally, we're actually like thank everyone's attention. Okay. Thank you. Now it's time for questions. So I have, I have a quick question. Hey, Alex. Okay. Thank you, Ray, for a good talk. I, I um, <clears throat> one question is uh, concerning the first part of your talk. So this protonation state that actually mattered quite a bit. I wonder if you consider it even a more complicated possibility when the protonation state changes upon binding and then you're adding a correction. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we actually first try to uh, run constant pH, you know, to really, to, to actually put that into the TI, you know, just using some script. The thing here is that at that time, right, I don't think the our engine is uh, stable, you know, when whenever we, you know, we can run MD, right, no problem, right, we just with a fixed prot protonation. But once you start to run constant pH, right, it just, uh, it just uh, the ligand just run away. run away. So there's right. some problem there, right? So that's why we, so we gave up, to, you know, consider a more elaborate, you know, the, the, the pronation can change during the, the TI simulation. So that's very well, unfortunate. You could, in principle, consider the possibility was the add when you add the correction a posteriori. So you assume protonation state change and then just add it as a sort of analytical term, it's pH dependent. Oh, correct? right, right, yes, that's, right. That's yeah, what I'm... Right, right, I agree, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we we had a little discussion there, yes. It's, uh, it's just, uh, I remember we tried try something like that, yes. I see. There, yeah, yeah, there a little bit, but it's just very, very limited, yeah. I see. yeah. My yeah. other quick question is regarding your last part with water. Yes, right, right. No surprises that I, I know have. Here. This question. Yeah. So, have you tried the bulk properties? You showed clusters. Right, right, right. Yes, that's not going to be a part of them. Yeah, we we just finished a, a first version of our MPI. So we okay. uh, definitely, yeah, that will be the the property. Well, this is gonna we're gonna see how the property behave, right? The bulk water. Yeah. So Thank you. we're working on this, right? Yeah. Thank you. We we'll have a student actually trying to. Yeah, there. We have the electrostatic there. And we're gonna try to uh, using uh, try to tune the manuals. Right now, we're just trying right to now, stay with uh, Leonard Jones. Uh, right? Leonard Jones. Jones. Leonard so simple Jones. model and see whether it's gonna work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Okay. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, this is Tom Simonson. Hi, Ray. Good, to, good to see you. Hi, Tom. Uh, good to see you. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Um, 
yeah, I was interested by your, you know, ionic uh, ligand binding and the kind of poor results with an additive force field. And I certainly agree with the idea that for ionic ligands or, or ionic mutations with proteins, you know, it's it's going to be important to move towards polarizable force fields. I mean, there is one mature polarizable protein force field, which I believe is implemented at AMBER, which is the Drude force field. So I was kind of interested that you didn't consider trying that, but rather move to developing a, a whole new polarizable force field. Um, I mean, the comment on the TOLA screening, which, you know, it violates the Poisson equation, it's a somewhat ad hoc, semi-empirical mm -hmm. functional form, but, you know, the same could be said of the, of the Van der Waals interaction and sort of other, a lot of other pieces of our, of our force fields. So I wonder if you considered uh, running Drude. And then the other point, which is connected, you know, when you, you show these very interesting um, benchmarks with your, your Gaussian, uh, you know, sort of polarizable Gaussian model. But if I think of the development of the Drude force field, you know, the first paper on liquid water was like 15 years ago. And um, I mean, we actually published uh, ionic mutations, free energy simulations five years ago. Those were the first ionic mutations with Drude. Um, so if we kind of translate that to the present, I mean, how do you kind of envision the, the okay. re-parameterization? Yeah, I, I see your point, yeah. Yeah, in a sense, yes, I think that char Amber does support charm force field, right, yeah. Yeah, but I don't think that, you know, I think that Alex is working on the Drew, some like a similar Drew the water model, right? But that's, uh, at least in Amber, we don't have a native Drew. We can only support Drew Charm just, Drew, right? I mean, as you know, it's right, Charm Drew, you know, but that's yeah, just yeah, particles with springs. So that's just normal right, right. molecular mechanics, and you can support right. that in Amber right, for right. sure. Yeah, we can support it. I, I, I think we have, yeah, we have the infrastructure to support it, right. We haven't really tried, tried any Drew model. Yes, right. Amber has been always with uh, induced dipole. I think starting from like when Peter Coleman was, uh, you know, in his last few year of his life, we're, we've been working on the uh, induced dipoles. We haven't had sure, any remember. sort of, a, yeah. Yeah, I know. So that is a, there's a historical reason, but apparently, you know, we, we should actually compare different models. We only compare with Amoeba right now. Yeah, definitely Drew is a, is a, that's a, you know, there's a, a big field of people working on Drew models. Yes. Yeah, so uh, definitely, you know, you're right, right? The, you know, liquid state is, is absolutely the next uh, phase. For us, the, it's a penny the neck to, to rewrite all the MD engines, you know, for CUDA, for everything. So that's clearly something, uh, you know, it's doable, right? It's just a, a lot of more calculation there, you know, we, for example, at least you have to have a, a lot of kernels, right? Three times more kernels uh, to, to, to do all of this uh, direct calculations. PME, you have to do a, a higher term orders to have the good enough uh, accuracy, you know, for, in, for interpretation of all the energy and field. You also need a, uh, derivative of field, right? So second derivative. So that is uh, very demanding for for the uh, for the PME part. You know, it's much slower than the point charge models. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but uh, yeah. We, Hi, Ray. Yeah, we, yeah. Yes. Hi, Ray. Here's Yana. Um, so. Hi, Yana. Hi. I, hi. Uh, we miss you here. Um, uh, I heard that your uh, flight yeah. got canceled or something happened. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I, my, 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 <laughs> My traffic, yeah, cost me a uh, missed that flight. Yeah. Darn it. Yeah. So, um, along the in the context of the Drew model, has anyone uh, tested whether that would improve uh, generally the protein ligand binding calculations? I, I'm not I mean, aware. Tom, of that. Tom, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I and then I want to continue also with what uh, Alexei was saying. You know, he and Emil showed uh, many years ago, I think more than 10 years ago, perhaps, in that uh, uh, paper, qu quarter review of biophysics paper. Oh, right, that, yes, right, yes. Right, so there's uh, many proteins have a change in PK values or protonation states, if you want right, to talk right, about right, yes. a specific right, pH right, yes. upon the combining. And you know, this can, they discussed the, the PK change of protein, but it can also happen to ligand. But any effect is Correct. that, 
you need to have a correction uh, for the binding affinity. Yes. Yeah, and this believe, is very yeah. easy. This is low-hanging fruit. This is the part I want to get is um, that in 2017, we, we, uh, we showed uh, in, in the JPCL paper that you can easily do a correction by simply yes. calculating the, the apple form versus the hollow form. Yes, right. right. Yeah, I believe um, we have that discussion in the so new paper. Yeah, you yeah. do not need to run constant pH simulation right, right, in your right, TI right. calculation. Yes, right, right. Yeah, we we have a little discussion about that. You know, the PK there's a there's a shift, right? You know, there's a when you bind a pump binding, there was a difference. Yeah, but yes, but I think we're, we're, the reason originally we try to do that is actually you know it would be nice to just uh, make sure that we have all the things like self automatically taken care of without all the yeah. uh, you know. Sort of post analysis. So, and somewhat uh, in the same context, uh, we actually found that the holomer um, really matters. So if you put the proton on the delta side versus epsilon side, it uh -huh. matters. Oh, um, you mean so for the for the his, right? Yeah, for, for the, the his thing, yes, yes. For the we his, show right, for, right, right. for instance, now, yeah. now we know uh, the native form of kinase, many of them are actually in the dimer form. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on where you put the proton, this dimer can be stable or not stable. And right, I think right, right. the community I, has not realized that. Yeah, for that one, I think uh, HIB is, a, is, a, is actually the best neutral form, I believe, for that one. There was a clash if you actually put on E, I think. He tried both, apparently, right, for that HID uh, pronation. Any more questions? If not, then uh, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, sure, go Tom, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, have you considered the, the uh, using the monovalent ions in part of your solution as a ligand? Oh yes, yes, it is. It is. You have to do it. Otherwise, you cannot do absolute binding. Yeah, right. you so, have to make them disappear together with the ligand. So you're always disappearing a neutral ligand. It's always neutral, right? There's no like issue with a. Uh, TI, right? So this charge is always fixed throughout the, yeah, you know, this uh, TI simulations. Okay. So you don't have to worry about correction of that. Okay. Then thanks, the first speaker of this afternoon, Ray Duo. Thank you. Thank you. And